Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Danis, and I am um, an adjunct professor here at the Institute of World Politics, where I teach a course in, in American uh, domestic terrorism and counterterrorism, and another course in violent non-state actors in today's security environment. Um, for those of you who are new to IWP, it is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degrees, and 18 certificates of graduate study. So we pretty much have the waterfront covered there, which is good. If you're interested in learning more about us, you can talk to one of our staff members, like Sean in the back there, who was turning the lights on um, at the end of the talk. Um, also, if you want to just support our work, our studies here, um, you can go to IWP and there is a donate button. It is still tax season, so it's not too late. Got till the 18th of April. Um, today's lecture, I'm very uh, pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Beju Gandhi, who's going to give us a talk on developing de-radicalization programs for domestic ex U.S. domestic extremism. He is a physician with a specialization in general psychiatry and subspecialization in the psychiatric care of the mentally ill. He graduated from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and the Harris School of Public Policy in 2009 with a joint MDMA in public policy. His interests include the intersection of behavioral science and national security. He's currently a student here at IWP pursuing a, a graduate certificate in nonviolent uh, nonviolent conflict. And with that, please welcome Dr. Beju Gandhi. Thank you, Professor. I'm very pleased to be with you all today. Uh, I'm Dr. Gandhi, and uh, I'm a psychiatrist and student at Institute of World Politics. Um, okay. Radicalization is a multifactorial dynamic process that involves a multitude of social and psychological factors i.e. there is no one terrorist personality and no one pathway into radicalization. In recent years, the threat from U.S. domestic extremists, particularly, and I'm talking about far-right white supremacists like neo-Nazis and skinheads, has been on the rise. However, terrorist incidents, domestic terrorist incidents overall, are still few enough that they remain difficult to detect for all of these reasons and more. Thus, a space for de-radicalization programming exists in the U.S. The focus of this presentation will be de-radicalization programming as well as prevention efforts that have been recently emphasized by the Department of Homeland Security. Knowing the relevant terminology is helpful in designing the goals of a program or initiative. Are we aiming for de-radicalization, disengagement, or prevention, or some combination of the above? De-radicalization in a broad sense can be framed as becoming less extreme in one's views. However, in a more absolutist definition, we might describe a full departure from said extremist views. Disengagement is, as the term suggests, describing a radical who no longer engages in violent behavior, but who may still hold some radical views. Prevention initiatives are myriad, and as the term suggests, aim to stop radical views from developing in at risk, but not yet radicalized individuals. Here we have some data indicating the rising threat from domestic terrorism. Per the Department of Homeland Security, and as reported by the Government Accountability Office, there has been a significant rise in domestic terrorism incidents in the last 10 years or so, with incidents being defined as either attacks or plots. Of note, according to US law, domestic terrorism is generally defined as involving criminal acts dangerous to human life occurring in the U.S. that appear intended to coerce a civilian population or influence or affect the conduct of government. From 2013 to 2021, also per GAO, open FBI <coughs> domestic terrorism cases rose by 357%, and domestic terrorism cases have doubled since 2020. As noted on the last line in the slide, a 2021 Office of Director of National Intelligence report noted an increased threat from racially motivated violent extremists, or RMVEs, whose agendas are derived from bias related to race or ethnicity, 
as well as militia violent extremists or MVEs, those who would take overt steps to violently resist or facilitate the overthrow of the US government based on an anti-government ideology. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'll have a handout that gives a nice sort of diagram of these yeah, different, they oh, they've got it, okay, great. Um, in recent years, the US approach to, to the domestic threat has begun to expand beyond the purely law enforcement approach, taking into account the multifactorial human variables involved behind this abhorrent behavior. So let's delve a bit further into the human or psychological or psychosocial aspect. In order to design de-radicalization or terrorism prevention programs, a conceptual understanding of the psychosocial process of radicalization is key. In the literature, there are many, many theories describing this process. And here I present the Sageman model for radicalization with a superimposed case example of Timothy McVeigh, the perpetrator of the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, where McVeigh, a domestic terrorist from Buffalo with an anti-government ideology used a makeshift truck bomb to kill 168 individuals at the federal Alfred P. Murrah building. The stages for the Sageman model are as follows, and this does not necessarily have to be in chronological order. Moral outrage, specific interpretation or worldview, contextualization with personal experience, and mobilization through interactive networks. So here I'll give a little background on McVeigh's life and offer my interpretation of how his life events correlate to the Sageman model. Much of the information regarding McVeigh's life is taken from the book, American Terrorist, which we read in Professor Danis's excellent class on domestic terrorism. To begin, Timothy McVeigh had a number of adverse experiences as a child. He was the victim of bullying. He was often medically ill. He was a witness to animal cruelty. He was very nearly hit by an automobile as a child. And his parents did not have a healthy marriage separating when McVeigh was nine. In his own words, quote, I have very few memories of my childhood, of interaction with my parents. I was often by myself or with neighbors. Most of my memories focus on that. From this, I believe he developed a sense of victimization, an us versus them mentality, a search for bullies. Later, as a soldier in Desert Storm, he felt the battle against the Iraqi forces was too easy, and his growing mistrust of, in his view, a bullying US government deepened. Despite being quite intelligent, he could never find a place for himself in the educational space and was unable to achieve his goal of entering into the Army Special Forces, despite demonstrated alacrity as an Army officer. His feelings of victimization and anger gradually were projected onto the U.S. government, whom he saw as the ultimate bully. As a young adult, he felt a sense of, as Sageman would write, moral outrage when key events that were upsetting to him occurred such as the federal government operations at Waco and Ruby Ridge or federal gu gun control legislation, such as the Brady Bill. His childhood and adult subjective experiences were quote unquote contextualized by him as evidence of vulnerable individuals needing protection against threatening tyrannical forces, whether it be that helpless child versus medical illness, a vulnerable animal versus those who would commit animal cruelty, an overmatched Iraqi fighting force versus a bullying American government, or gun owners succumbing to federal government intrusion on gun rights. In this way, he connected or contextualized his life experiences with the worldview that began to take root early in his life. McVeigh later in his adulthood found a supportive sounding board in his military friends slash co-conspirators, Terry Nichols and Michael Fortier his acquaintances in the gun show circuit through which he drifted much of his young adult years and his obsession with the anti-government with anti-government propaganda such as the vitriolic violent anti-semitic anti-government reading the turner diaries all of these interactions constituted his mobilization through interactive networks and in this context by mobilization i mean mobilization towards his final act of violent terrorism Taking a step back to analyze an individual's path towards radicalization and noting that there are many different paths into radicalization helps us to understand that need for de-radicalization and terrorism prevention programs that take into account the human element. 
And if there is indeed some sort of method to the madness, if you will, the hope is that a structured the hope is that there is a structured, reproducible way to help get individuals off the path toward radicalization. While there are many theories regarding how one becomes radicalized, the literature is less robust on theories regarding de-radicalization. One idea is that an individual in a radical milieu encounters a key event at a key point in time, a reorienting event, such as a racial violent extremists having a positive encounter with a minority, then leading to an opening of the mind, i.e. that in a radical mindset, there is a black or white type of thinking, one problem, one solution. But after a key event inducing a, what the RAND Corporation in a recent report terms cognitive opening, the individual may begin to consider alternative ways of thinking about a problem a process termed by de-radicalization expert Daniel Kohler as, quote, re-plurification, or a move away from that black or white mindset, an ability to consider alternative possibilities to conceptualizing the problems the person was previously engaging in. The push-pull model, I think, is also highly relevant when designing terrorism prevention or de-radicalization programming. And it takes a look more so at the social dynamics at work. When an individual is in a radicalized milieu, there may be factors within the group pushing them out, such as threats of violence from within the group, threats of violence from peers. Conversely, there may also be pull factors or factors external to the group that are pulling them out of the group. For example, duties regarding childcare or employment. A recognition of these factors or needs is helpful in designing specific interventions. Here we have the public health model for disease prevention that current US federal funding efforts is roughly organized around in the de-radicalization and prevention space. I think it provides a reasonable scaffolding for organizing the various programs in existence and those in development. In the medical model, primary prevention is aimed at full prevention of disease prior to onset of symptoms, for example, through the use of a vaccine. Similarly, in the de-radicalization and prevention space, Programs at the primary prevention level are aimed at individuals who are not yet fully radicalized. Example programs may include mental health referral programs and educational programs targeting youths. This underlies the Department of Homeland Security's recent, quote, whole of society approach espoused um, by their new preventative programs where funding targets multiple levels of civil and law enforcement sectors. Secondary prevention on the medical side or in the public health world targets disease in its early stages, such as the use of a screening mammogram to detect breast cancer. In the de-radicalization and terrorism prevention space, programs target at-risk individuals who may have already begun the process of radicalization. Example initiatives may involve campaigns to counter extremist propaganda or to teach individuals about uh, warning signs, such as professionals in education, health, or law enforcement. Finally, tertiary prevention in medical terms is aimed at preventing future recurrence of disease or mitigating symptoms, symptoms of disease once it has reached its later stages. An example might be adding medication to treat diabetes after dietary interventions have failed. Regarding de-radicalization and terrorism prevention, programs target individuals who are already radicalized and may have already committed acts of violence. This is where we see formal, structured, multimodal uh, de-radicalization programs, such as Exit Germany or Exit Sweden, that are already in existence. And in this way, I think the public health model nicely encapsulates the spectrum from prevention to de-radicalization programming. Europe has been involved in de-radicalization programming for many decades, while in the US, only one such formal program exists, which um, I will touch on momentarily. After reviewing the literature, the following are key elements to consider when designing programs at the primary, secondary, or tertiary levels. Programs should be locally driven so as to not be seen as an arm of the state. They need to be individualized as able, taking into account that there are many different paths into radicalization and many different specific individual risk factors. Programs should link individuals to services to meet human needs, such as vocational services or mental health care. 
the use of former extremists or formers is often deployed and can be considered depending on the setting. <coughs> Data on outcomes and program evaluation is sparse in this field, but growing. And as such, developing programs should keep data such as number of participants to try and measure criminology variables such as recidivism. Finally, that programs generally should be voluntary, although the question of participating in de-radicalization programming as part of sentencing is certainly one to explore. Here are a couple of examples of tertiary programs. In Germany, formal de-radicalization programming aimed at individuals already involved in radical groups, particularly those far-right white extremist groups such as neo-Nazis and skinheads has been in place for decades. Exit Germany is one such program that is voluntary, focuses on the use of former extremists as mentors, and engages individuals both in the community and prison space. While formal de-radicalization programs targeting those who have committed acts have been in existence for some time in Europe, in the US I'm aware of only one, the Minnesota Terrorism Disengagement and De-Radicalization Program. It was started by a local district judge in Minnesota. It was started as part of the sentencing process for Somalis in Minnesota who had gone off to fight with ISIS, returned, and are now within the, legal, the US domestic legal system. It involves uh, an individualized assessment of a person's needs and involves uh, referrals to multiple disciplines such as vocational rehab, mental health, et cetera. A representative description of this program from one of its key officers reads as follows. Our approach is one of the primary ones in the country, but the problem with that is it starts at the time of arrest. It doesn't start at education or prevention for people who have been exposed. Here, I'll play a brief video that gives a small tangible taste of what the Exit Germany program is about. Right-wing extremism is on the rise, but one former Nazi is fighting back. Ingo Hasselbach used to be a neo-Nazi leader in Berlin. Now, he's creating a way to help others break free from the students group. Well, I was a from my birth and name of the woman. I mean, every single problem would think about somebody like me. I was a for a while back, so I was definitely for eight, and foreigners, Jews, left wing. So, it was the idea the Germania, the center of all the area, race more than I joined the movement um, back in East Germany and around 86, 87, when I was in prison. But as neo Nazi violence escalated, by 1993, he realized he wanted to leave the fascist movement. It was probably the most difficult thing I have ever done because I started from scratch. I believe all my friends, there was nothing like outside the movement. I was in huge, great danger over the years and I had to start a new life. He wanted to create a way to fight extremism and give others an easy way out that didn't involve the state. There has to be a place where people who would like to leave the movement can go. You don't want to deal with police and state. It's a difficult trust relationship, so there has to be an independent organization. Ingo teamed up with former police detective Bernd Wagner, who had once arrested him. And together they created Exit Deutschland. Along with one of my family suffered a lot due to the Nazi era, so I know the danger of their ideology. But I've always believed that people can change. We help them to realize new goals for themselves. Exit uses neo-Nazi marches to fundraise for its de-radicalization programs, transforming them into involuntary charity walks, where people can donate money to Exit for every meter the neo-Nazis walk. They also give out black t-shirts, which change their message when washed. Extremists must contact Exit to seek assistance. Former neo Nazis like Ingo are able to win their trust. The organization has found that many people want to leave but don't feel they have a way out. It's particularly hard and dangerous for women and children. They need most of our support, especially because some Nazis were very professional when it comes to finding them, punishing them, or training them. Exit helps people 
relocate and rebuild their lives and beliefs. Since 2000, Exit has successfully de radicalized almost 700 people. We have to fight racism, we have to fight fascism. We have racism is the worst thing you can do, and it's the, the worst decision you can make. As has been mentioned, the U.S. in the last 10 years approximately has ramped up federal efforts at funding domestic extremism. In 2020, a $20 million grant was afforded to the Department of Homeland Security to fund a variety of projects working at the local level, primarily within the primary and secondary prevention levels. Um, I colloquially personally term it uh, the laboratories of de-radicalization after the idea of the states being the laboratories of democracy, because what DHS is doing is, is funding multiple different projects in different states, <coughs> uh, a media literacy project at a university here, training for warning sign for professionals in a different state. The, uh, the sub department of DHS that heads this program is the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships or CP3. And the name of the specific program is the Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Program, or TVTP. Uh, this is just a, a, a listing of the different um, titles of the different types of projects that are funded by this grant. And I think it provides a brief overview of the types of ideas that are being funded, um, raising societal awareness, civic engagement, youth resilience, threat assessment, et cetera. Here are examples of primary, tertiary, secondary, and tertiary programs. Um, Life After Hate is a independent 501c3 organization out of Chicago. It's one of the oldest programs, and it works at the tertiary space, working with individuals who have already been in a radical milieu and utilizes, similar to the exit programs in Europe, uh, the mentoring from former extremists. And we'll see a brief video on Life After Hate in the next slide. The next two are example projects that are funded by this DHS grant uh, right here at home in the district. Um, we have a project to train uh, law enforcement officials on warning signs, an example of secondary prevention. And uh, at the University of Maryland, uh, there is a primary prevention project related to uh, media literacy for uh, disinformation. Here is a brief video on Life After Hate to give you a taste of a home program. There's this group that you're a part of now. You work with people who have, were like you? In part, yes. Uh, I work for an organization called Life After Hate. Uh, we uh, have a few co-founders. Uh, it was born as a nonprofit in 2011, and we do a lot of different things. Um, one of which is run support groups uh, to individuals like myself who are on their way out, um, who ask for help. Uh, some people who have already gotten out but are still struggling and looking for community. We do community outreach um, training. We're working in academics and lots of different areas. But have your former friends threatened you? Um, I have been threatened um, as one of the only organizations in the country working specifically uh, in this area doing this work. We get trolled all the time, and that's just part of the territory and something that we all, um, we're willing to deal with that because we need change right now. And there are not many individuals in the unique position that we are in to work from both sides of this and to understand what it's like to be on the inside and then what it's like to work on the outside. Never miss a big. Okay, thank you, Larry. Outcome slash program evaluation in this area is key. Much of the data is qualitative, such as interviews with former extremists detailing what factors help them leave the movement. While quantitative data is relatively sparse, I do believe there is room to grow 
and borrow from criminology. Here I've posted a highlight of a systematic review I found from the START program on terrorism studies at the University of Maryland that showed uh, some data indicating that the European exit programs uh, may be having uh, low rates of recidivism. But overall empirical data is still lacking. Finally, some concluding thoughts. Drawing on my experience treating patients, where the need for a multidisciplinary approach is the rule rather than the exception, and after reviewing current DHS efforts, I like the, quote, whole of society multifactorial approach that DHS seems to be following. The key next steps will involve assessing outcomes and effectiveness of these programs and may require measurement of variables outside of traditional criminology variables, such as recidivism. For example, measuring change in attitude of participants in the program or assessing knowledge of professionals receiving training. With that, I thank you for your time and I'll be happy to discuss any questions. So in, in the United States, we have a presidential electoral system, but we go through an electoral college. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I point that out because there are only two major parties in our presidential system, whereas in other presidential systems, there mm -hmm. are always multi-party systems. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that the lack of a multi-party system where different audiences can find different political parties that might be closer to what they want. Do you think that that's a, a unique barrier in the United States that might cause more radical views in our country than, than compared to other democracies? Uh, I have thought about this. Um, while it wasn't the specific target of my uh, research, um, uh, my concept of de-radicalization and terrorism programming is that it's one tool in a in a even broader uh, soup of of things to attack this problem. And certainly the thought occurred to me that uh, de-radicalization and terrorism prevention alone certainly is not the, the panacea, and that there are these larger institutional factors that may be playing a role, like gerrymandering, for example. And so, yeah, I mean, if I had a magic wand, um, I would address some of these institutional factors as well as prevention programs, you know, which would be another way of looking at this whole of society approach. Thank you for this lecture. Um, when you were first talking about the three approaches to treatment, the in the primary approach, I apologize if I misheard. Mm -hmm. um, did you mention something about vaccination? Yeah, so, so, so yeah, so using vaccination as an example of, of the primary prevention concept. So, right, so um, vaccination will be targeting individuals who have not yet um, contracted disease or trying to prevent them from getting a disease. Um, and then the analogy being that by doing, you know, programs in schools for youths, they are already quote unquote inoculated against some of the radical ideas they might encounter in the future. Although it's, it's not a perfect analogy and there's certainly debate and, and uh, uh, back and forth about how translatable exactly the public health model is. It's, it seems to be the, the approach that DHS is taking. Uh, how, how does this from, let's say, the de-radicalization of uh, uh, people identified as uh, religious Islamic uh, terrorists. Yeah. Um, the, the idea, I think, is that the, the, program would, the programs would uh, be able to accept all types of extremism. Um, the exit programs in Europe, for example, they, they do work with some of the uh, Islamist extremists as well. Um, and I, I think that's what the government's, my interpretation is that's what the government's hope is, is that by calling it targeted violence and by taking this preventative approach that they're 
they're hopefully encompassing of uh, the large soup of folks. And the, Minis the one de-radicalization program, which was not federally started, it was locally started in Minnesota, was, was born out of the Islamist uh, extremist problem. But that's, I guess, assuming that the causal, the causation is similar. Mm. Uh, I think there's I think there's debate on that. I think that I think that there is there is a commonality as far as human needs, the void that the individual may have experienced in their youth, and then the structure and the ideology that comes in later to fill in that 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 void. Um, De-radicalization programs abroad, like those in Saudi Arabia, they can of course be more let's say forceful than what we can here, using more religious mentoring and ideology and so forth. And the approach here in the U.S. has been not to look at it that way or not to not to do the religious mentoring and the ideo ideological mentoring from a religious point of view as much from what I can uh, tell. How do you uh, target uh, a rural area where you have homeschooling and hence yeah. uh, Suspicion of outsiders, where yeah. communities basically look at anybody coming in as, as yeah. the devil. Right. How do, how do you target that? Yeah. Um, Public-private partnership would be my my best answer. Meaning that the 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 meat of the program that is targeting those areas is being started from the local level, and maybe there's funding coming in from DHS. But the, the visibility is really local and the, the local partners are the ones who are who know the area and who are designing interventions. So a comment and a question. That that question kind of gets to the point of where does free speech end, right? In the US government space, from my time being in the US government, the, the the dividing line is violence, right? You can stand on a street corner and, and pronounce how you love Hitler every day of the year for the rest of your life, and people will walk by you, and, and that's fine. But as soon as you take the violence, that is where the dividing line is. That's where law enforcement gets involved, and that's what a lot of these programs are trying to prevent. Um, you may not be able to change somebody's mind, but you may be able to get them to, to not go the violent path, right? So that's. Uh, a lot of our terrorism prevention, unfortunately, has been law enforcement. Somebody's arrested after the fact and they get like first murder or whatever. Which, which does get to the, my question here, which is, you know, why, does, why doesn't the government take a more direct role, right? What you talk about are programs, DHS programs, um, to fund private actors. There are some countries where, like Saudi Arabia, which is notable for its direct role in um, you know, de-radicalization. Um, can you talk about some of the factors why the United States federal government is, yeah. can't do that? Well, I, I think my interpretation would be that they, they're uh, afraid of being seen as a as an arm of the state, that it might have a, have a, a, a paradoxical effect. Um, for example, in Britain, the, the prevent program, there's some data to suggest that's their de-radicalization type program. There's some data to suggest that its more heavy-handed approach may have actually radicalized some individuals because of its, its, you know, hey, I'm the government, I'm here to help you kind of approach. And as we saw in the video in Exit Germany, the former extremist was saying, I don't want to, um, I, I don't trust government. I don't want to do a program that's, that's a direct program from the government. Um, and as uh, Professor Danis was, was chatting with me earlier, he was indicating that um, if we had a formal de-radicalization program through the federal government, uh, would the government be liable for uh, any acts that any individual might act on uh, after they complete the program? They say they complete a program and then they still go out and do something. Um, you know, are they responsible for that? So there's, I think, all of those questions. and. Um, you know, we have uh, this problem with school shootings now, and I think that, I think the government's approach, uh, again, I don't work for <laughs> DHS, so this is my interpretation from afar, is that it wants to use broad terms like targeted violence and target 
kind of common pathways, school shootings, uh, in my line of work, you know, like suicide prevention and suicide risk assessment, criminology risk assessment, uh, terrorism prevention, there's common factors here and they're sort of working at that level right now. You know, a lot of work in gangs, you know, getting youth out of gangs. Yeah. A lot of that kind of police at the lower level. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So I, I have a question about just what, what are your thoughts on another framework that I was introduced to in, in my undergraduate program. Mm -hmm. There was a discussion about terrorist actors, that there are some who are soft landers and some who are hard landers. Mm -hmm. But if you use the right um, incentives and you negotiate with enough people, you can find conditions where you can pull a lot of yeah. soft liners from out yeah. of the terrorist groups to, to separate reluctant terrorists from hardline terrorists. Yeah. I just wanted your comment on whether or not you thought that's an appropriate framework or not. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to programs being individualized. Um, you know, the most hardened uh, folks in these groups, they're going to be very difficult, of course, to de-radicalize. I'm sure if we got to Timothy McVeigh, you know, a week before he committed the act, you know, it would be delusional perhaps to say that we could convince him that government is good. Um, but, and, and that goes into evaluating programs too. Um, are these, what kind of offenders or what kind of individuals are these programs picking off? Are these the sort of the low hanging fruit, the ones who already want to change are the ones who are maybe more likely to volunteer for these preventative efforts. And so then down the road, perhaps we get more data from this Minnesota program or other programs. And then does the government look at other steps to start doing stuff you know, in the sentencing space and in the prison space? Um, yeah. Thank you. In, in general, though, you don't believe that the soft line or hard line, it's not, it's not an inappropriate way to categorize people? Uh, that, that sounds like it, like an okay dichotomy to me. You know, I mean, there are, there are those who are softliners or those who are less radicalized and perhaps easier to bring in to yeah. bring into a program. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the factors that you identified. Oh yeah. <laughs> In the factors that you identified on the previous slide, uh, you have for factors that would make the uh, program more effective. You have individualized and voluntary. Mm -hmm. That's for getting them to be effective. How do you how do you get those two factors to fit in for big U.S. government to bite and actually fund these programs? If they're individualized and voluntary, mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot of resources. But... Yeah. Well, I I think the next step is to see what comes out of program evaluation for this twenty million dollar grant, and to see see how effective these these preventative efforts are and then i think from there and then it probably will depend on who the next administration is too because you know there was a gap in some of the funding from 16 to 20. um so you know that consistency and that those going back to the other gentleman's questions about the broader institutional factors i think that'll play a role also so um, but from what i've seen there's been more there's been more momentum you know, it kind of started in 2011 under Obama as far as federal funding going into this domestic terrorism uh, efforts. And then it was called Countering Violent Extremism in 2016, the, the grant program, sort of the predecessor to the TBTP program. And then uh, then it evolved into what it is currently. And you know, we're still in very nascent, nascent stages. So we'll see. I don't know if that fully answered your question or not. <laughs> How does the de-radicalization community view the January 6th and the folks who have been sentenced because of their violent acts of January 6th? How does the community think it should be dealt with? Is there much of a debate? Hmm. Um, to be honest, I my paper and my work with Professor Dana so far is kind of focused more on the the the, the far extremists, like the neo-Nazi types. Um, but I think uh, uh, Folks like Daniel Kohler, the GERDS program, the German Institute for Deradicalization that he runs, the START program at University of Maryland. I have seen papers that are starting to kind of look at that issue. Um, but uh, my knowledge of, of your question is a little bit nascent right now. Are there any questions? 
All right. And as was mentioned, this started out as a paper for my domestic terrorism course, and it's developed into this, and it's actually evolved over time as, as you know, the issues have evolved. Uh, as Dr. Gandhi mentioned, you know, the, these programs in DHS space change names, they change acronyms, they change funding, they change leadership, and they go in different directions. And we, I've, I've seen it over the last four administrations, they, they keep changing. So um, it's, it's a moving target, and I think he's done a good job trying to, trying to capture some of that. All right, so I'd like to thank Dr. Gandhi and all of you joined us today. If you want to attend any other upcoming events, obviously you can get on our email list. Um, we have plenty of them. Or if you're interested in one of our programs or, or um, supporting the school, you can certainly see um, Sean here in the room and he can take care of you in that. But uh, once again, thanks to Dr. Gandhi.